With cyber attacks on the rise, protecting your data security is more important than ever. So why is Congress considering a bill that puts your credit card data at greater risk of being hacked and exposed to foreign networks? The Durbin Marshall credit card bill shifts billions in consumer spending to less secure payment networks, all so that corporate megastores can make bigger profits. Don't let Durbin Marshall steal your data. Visit electronicpaymentscoalition.org and tell your senators to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. He's talking about a bloodbath for America. It's laid out in the terms of it. And these idiots uh, on Twitter, uh, these idiots uh, on, 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 on cable news, these idiots on Sunday shows, going, well, yeah, well, presidents, you know, he was talking only about the auto industry, and this is one more. It's just bullshit. Let me say that at 6.15 a.m. It's just bullshit. He knew what he was doing. We're not stupid. Americans aren't stupid. He was talking about a bloodbath. Sometimes a bloodbath means a bloodbath. And when he finishes by saying, and that's just going to be the least of it, seriously, these people may be stupid. We're not. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Just a catch of strays over here. <laughs> You're in for a hell of a show. Keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. It's time for our main event. Welcome back to the Ruthless Variety program, fellas. Uh, we're here sans one. Mm -hmm. uh, comfortably smug is absent today. I can only imagine that it is Corona like 6.0. Yeah. Whatever we call Corona in this day and age. Oh well, we don't know because he will it's be pa he'll be patient zero for this no, new. Yes. Let's let's be honest. The listeners have called in. Oh, here we They've go. They've said that they don't want a Jeb voice on the show. <laughs> oh, they want somebody who I supports our candidate, President Trump. <laughs> And they're done with him. Oh my so God. let's be honest to the audience about what's actually happened. Here. In case you missed last last week, uh, Smug came at uh, Mr. Ashbrook here. So I think he's returning serve. He's returning serve, uh, all in fair play. And when you miss the program, I guess you got what you it have. Comes coming. with the territory, as I've said to you, Holmes. Like, if called upon, I will serve as official commissioner of the Ruthless Variety Program, and where we could institute some sort of like pay docking situation or fine oh, system. Okay. But I think in lieu of that... Well, see, seeing as though we're not paid, it would yeah. be tough to, <laughs> to dock it. Well, uh, we could uh, we could dock um, perhaps an alcohol allotment. Or maybe um, just hold, like, Wolf accountable. Yeah. That yeah. would be good. <laughs> Wait, so he's supposed to be the whipping boy for Smug not showing up? <laughs> okay, not Wolf, spaghetti. Okay, All spaghetti. Right. That you, makes more one sense. One fewer meatballs. Every week you get one less meatball. That's exactly right. And yeah. when Spaghetti's whole family should know that when Smug doesn't arrive, one fewer meatball on the plate. Yeah. Um, well, like Wolf likes us to do, you know, he likes the meat up front. Yeah. That's what he likes. And yes. that's what we did with uh, that Scarborough clip that you heard that was Morning Joe mm -hmm. off the top. Mm -hmm. uh, I found it particularly fascinating. He was talking about idiots on cable news. <laughs> yeah, I just, Joe's really not having a normal one, huh? <laughs> no. uh, and, and as he said, 6.15 in the morning. Wow, I mean, gosh. 6.15, he, he's coming in hot. Geez, he's like pounding the Celsius? Or was, is... and did, was he trying to do an impression of Larry Kudlow? I don't know. I, to me, it sounded like he was mocking Larry Kudlow. I don't know. Just like an expert in economy and all things else. Like the guy was a legend from the Reagan administration. Joe Scarborough actually has used the term bloodbath over and over and over again in different contexts on his show. Sure. And so all of a sudden, Trump says it about the auto industry, and he's like joining in with every other newspaper in the country saying that – this is the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. So if you were like me and you had kids in baseball practices and you were watching the players and you mm -hmm. were trying to catch the seeding tournament for March Madness, some of this may have escaped you. But over the weekend, uh, the president did a speech in Ohio mm -hmm. where he mentioned the word bloodbath. And that has caused an immense amount of uh, consternation on the left about exactly what it is that he meant. So uh, first we're gonna do is provide you some of the graphics of the headlines that has been uh, written based on his speech. And then we're gonna show you what he actually said. Mm -hmm. And you can be the judge, jury, and executioner of the listener of the program about what it is that he actually meant. If we can go to uh, 
the first graphic please wolf. This is NBC. So, you know, here's the thing. Scarborough didn't have to go very far for the first one. All right? Stays right here at home. It says on NBC, Trump says there will be a quote-unquote bloodbath if he loses the election. And, of course, what they're trying to uh, infer is that there is some kind of a insurrection. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That, that Donald Trump is declaring civil war yes. if he loses. That's what they want people to think. That's what – and that is the core of what they're – the case they are trying to make against Donald Trump is that mm-hmm. if somehow if he loses an election, civil war uh, is inevitable mm-hmm. because this is what he's trying to say. And so they're taking him at his word. Uh, bloodbath. OK, so let's go to graphic two. These are a series of headlines uh, about all about the bloodbath. Trump says some migrants are people, warrants a bloodbath if he loses. Uh, New York Times says Trump says some migrants are not people and uh, predicts a bloodbath, right? I mean, you can see the pattern mm-hmm. that we're, that we're yeah, having well, what, in the mainstream uh, media. What I want to know is what does Joe have to complain about? Seems like this banged around the internet pretty well and good. Yeah, he's like, oh, they're not covering it fairly. I not enough. <laughs> every, every publication in the English-speaking world seemed to take his version of events. Why don't you have a listen to what Donald Trump actually said go ahead and play that clip spaghetti those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in mexico right now and you think you're going to get that you're going to not hire americans and you're going to sell the cars to us now we're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line and you're not going to be able to sell those cars if i get elected now if i don't get elected it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole that's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. <laughs> just just not, the, not what they're saying it is at all. The media wants you to think that what he said is the first shots on Fort Sumter. Right. <laughs> they literally want you to think that he is kicking off a civil war six months before the election. They're not telling you the truth. It's that. The auto industry is going to lose jobs because Joe Biden is is literally firing the employees because of his policies. He's he is eliminating an entire industry because of his policies. They pull one word out of Donald Trump's speech in order to say something completely different. Americans for Prosperity has done it again. You're going to love this. Know how Biden's been running around the country bragging about Bidenomics and the media is doing stories on how the president has embraced the term. Well, guess what? Americans for Prosperity just bought the Bidenomics.com domain name. I can't believe the White House didn't get this first. This would be like Pepsi buying Coca-Cola.com. It's hilarious. Bidenomics.com sets the record straight on the failures of Joe Biden's economy, his horrible record on cost of living, wages, debt, deficits, energy, and more. I've been to the site. I can tell you, it's not what Joe Biden wants Americans to see. AFP takes Biden's own words and compares them to the reality of everyday Americans. It's packed with facts and stories that prove Bidenomics is a costly failure. Americans for Prosperity deserves a lot, a lot of credit for this coup. Visit Bidenomics.com soon, the website Joe Biden doesn't want you to see. Look, you can go back a year, and we've talked about this on the Variety program, about how how the media covers Donald Trump when he's in a primary election mm-hmm. and the process involved in it. And they'll, they'll cover the court cases and everything else and they'll take their shots where they can. But ultimately it's about like, is he ahead? Is he behind? It's kind of horse race coverage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we predicted very early on that the moment this becomes a general election, they'll turn the table entirely and make this just a prosecution of their narrative. Mm-hmm. And their narrative is that this is some like lawless... Uh, autocrat mm-hmm. who is is ready to just destroy this country, and if he can't be president, he's fine if nobody is president, mm-hmm. right? I mean, this is like they want to extrapolate out all of the worst fears of the left of January 6th in terms of what this guy is going to do to the country if he were to lose this election, and that's like their narrative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think there's actually two competing narratives on the left right now. <clears throat> and you, if you talk to Democrats, they'll willingly admit it. It's like they haven't really been able to decide whether to 
run against uh, Donald Trump on rhetoric or record. Um, rhetoric being like January 6th, uh, you know, democracy's on the line, you know, autocrat, all of that sort of stuff versus record. Like, do we talk more about, you know, Dobbs? Do we talk about you know, tax cuts for the rich? Yada, yada, yada. You know, I mean, I think this opening segment here clearly tells us that uh, rhetoric is winning. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but but here's here's the thing that gets me. It's like, why can't they just reduce grocery prices? Why can't they just close the border? Why can't they just stop crime? Don't don't you dare suggest to liberal Joe Biden that he's supposed to stop the inflow of terrorists at our southern border because what he really needs to do is lie about what Donald Trump says for a living. Well, I mean, like, the problem is, is that their ideology runs up against the record. And the reality is, is they've in, put in place their ideological views of what ought, ought to happen and a whole bunch of domestic issues. And what it's resulted in is incredibly high inflation, an open border, crime everywhere. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's sucked. And everybody knows that. I mean, that's the reason why he's trailing. If you look at the, the these polls, it's not everybody pays attention to where the the ballot number is. And Trump's been leading pretty consistently in every nationwide poll. But much more importantly is underneath that. If your issue is immigration, he's got a 20 point lead. If your issue is crime, he's got a 20 point lead. If your issue is the economy, he's got a 10 point lead. Yeah. If your issue, you know, I mean, yeah. you can go down each and every right. silo of information that people actually care about and vote on. He's got a huge lead right. on that. And right. so they can't argue that. They can't. What they can only argue at this stage is that this is a danger, a clear and present danger. And I, I will say this. It sounds crazy mm -hmm. that you could campaign on this. And we were selling all of this short in the 22 election. Mm -hmm. But they did it. They did it. And they won with it. Yeah, and and I I agree, and we've talked about this a lot on the show. But Donald Trump's name also wasn't on those ballots in in the midterm, and I do wonder. I do wonder if they're falling in the same trap that they fell in in 2016, where they made different versions of the same argument about behavior and is he is he qualified? Is he unfit? Donald mm -hmm. Trump, yada yada yada, and like, if I'm a, I don't offer a lot of free advice to Democrats on this show. Yeah. But I wonder if, like, you're falling into the same trap that Hillary Clinton did, where, like, you're so busy chasing around Donald Trump's message all over the place that you get yourself, you know, wrapped into a pretzel to the point where you're at the DNC and your main talking point is America's already great. Mm -hmm. make, make America great again. For who? That is, that's a racist dog whistle <laughs> to a past. And it's like, if you're going to say stuff like America's already great, you just lost every person in this country that's struggling to make ends meet. Right. And so, like, I wonder if they realize what they're doing, because it seems like they're doing 2016 all over again, where they light their hair on fire every week about what Trump says. And I just I don't think that's a winning strategy. No, I, I tend to agree with that. I think the one distinction between 2016 and 2024 and what they're dealing with is Jan 6 and the post-election yeah. behavior. And sure. there are an awful lot of Republicans that showed up in the vote share of like Nikki Haley, for example, of people who were tremendously troubled mm. by post-election 2020 and everything else. They're on board for the big win. They're, they, they're present and accounted for in the who do you trust more category on issues like immigration, crime, economy, you name it. Yeah. But they're uh, real soft I, when it, it comes into the ballot question. One, one thing, though, you remember the conversation we had with Meghan McCain and and, uh, and MK. Uh, you know, Hammer made a really good point when, like, she was on CNN during those early days of the Trump administration, and that is, like, every story became an 11. Yeah. And so no story was really an 11. And that's I, the story of Donald Trump. Right. Right. And so what I what I wonder is, like, in in doing it with this story and there will be thousands more they will cover between now and, and November. Do they ultimately desensitize the election Without from the, like the Jan six stuff, which we saw had had relevance to the electorate in 2022. I guess yeah. ultimately that's my point. Without, no, I think without, that's a good one. You know? Without question, not only are they desensitizing the electorate to that particular issue, but they are desensitizing the electorate to anything they say. Like, 
people are increasingly turning off mainstream press and and to the extent that they write bloodbath in their headline or say bloodbath on their 5 a.m morning joe show people are changing the channel because they know it's not true because what they're concerned about terrorists coming over the border crime in their cities grocery store prices out of control they have a president who will not address those things and they have a challenger who they remember when he was in office, life was a little bit better for them. Yeah. So I think it's as simple as that. And I think that's going to continue to set up is the dichotomy in this race. And by the way, it's really interesting that you mentioned um, uh, some of that stuff that you were talking about earlier. Holmes is I, I was talking to my dad the other day and he was like, man, so many people. Everybody's talking about Joe Biden's age, his age, his age. Nobody is talking about how much of a left winger the guy has been. And that's really what turns a lot of people off is how Mm -hmm. far left he's gone on so many issues. If you looked at his his State of the Union speech, everybody's like, oh, he he messed up a bunch of words. He messed up a bunch of names. He proposed a gigantic tax increase. (laughs) I mean, like 17 tax increases. Exactly. So so there there is so much that's wrong with the guy that's not quite captured in his age and inability to do the job, which he's not able to do it, but like he's even worse than that. And I I think the more that there's focus on the details of this guy as an inadequate president, the less likely people are to vote for him. Well, that's that's entirely true. But what the left is trying to do is make this a referendum on Trump, Mm -hmm. not a referendum on the sitting United States president. Use the discontent that we have across this country in the right track, wrong track, to try to fuse that to a former president, not the current president. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is a montage that was put together by Grabian Mm -hmm. that I think gives you a good sense of what it is that they are trying to do to this guy. Clip two, please, Spaghetti. Would a second Donald Trump term look like? Well, he cannot be the next president. Um, it, it, because if he is, you can't imagine the things that he's going to do. Mexico, Canada, we can't go to Canada because eventually Canada will become annexed to America and shoot visitors to the White House. Yeah, that means he can shoot the first lady. We're going to see violence, <laughs> the likes of which we didn't even see on January 6th. <laughs> make it illegal to run against him, to throw his opponents in jail, to shut down the media. He will make himself into the Fuhrer, and he will make everybody raise their hand and salute him. Using martial law against the American people. Terminate the Constitution. To rewrite the Constitution. Create mass internment camps. Throw everyone into Gitmo. Might be sent to jail, or their rights might be suppressed, especially minority groups in society. You might have any number of things happen to you and your family. Everyone. One of us, our freedom, our liberty, none of us is safe. It's going to have people around him executing against an enemy's list. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'm talking about with the everything's turned to 11. You know, yeah, I, mean, that's in, just, I mean, it's just insane. He's going to shoot Melania. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they that's what I they're mean, telling people. Big thanks to our, our friends at Grabian for putting that together, because that I mean, that just gives it boils it right down. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, everything there, to your point, right. is 11 or more. Which is completely ridiculous, completely insane, but it's like it's what they're trying to mainstream mm-hmm. into the thought process of your average American voter. Like if you can look at graphic three here, this is Politico this week. Uh, graphic three says Trump often uses jokes and laughter to normalize his behavior, a trick used by autocrats <laughs> of the past. <laughs> It's just, oh, it's just a trick. Ridiculous. It's a trick. Oh, you're fun. Oh, I get it. So you can be funny and people don't pay attention to the fact that you're trying to concentration camp them. Yeah. I mean, that's just like that's so. It. It, 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 it's, it's not just that he's riffing. Like, like if people just realize that Donald Trump is always riffing, he's always trying to figure out his tight five for the comedy store. <laughs> like if people just understood that, it would make so much more sense than trying to extrapolate out these like ideas of autocracy. So listen to this. I mean, this is. I'm going to read you a couple of just little excerpts of this, where you get a, a flavor of where this is going, because you're going to see in short form what this is in in long form. His critics, along with experts in rhetoric and nationalist populist movements, <laughs> and leaders say, "Hold on, it helps him turn his opponents into not just enemies but jokes." They say it helps him recast his own abilities as laughing matters 
and desensitizes his supporters to his most outrageous comments and proposals. And the undermining of institutions and the abandonment of allies, mass deportations, and all but outright invitations for Russian invasions, and so on. They say the mirth masks the menace. Mm. <laughs> I mean, come on, dude. I mean, come on. The, like, okay, what people like about Donald Trump, we'll just cut to it. What people like about Donald Trump is that he does on stage in front of like 20,000 people what your funniest relative does mm -hmm. about making observations of the absurdity of this country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the decision making that goes into, I don't know, like let's take the auto thing that he was talking about. The absurdity that goes into making a, an American auto industry entirely reliant on a place like China, a global adversary for batteries rather than a asset that you have to the world in terms of your own energy construct, right? I mean, it, it, decision making like that, that's laughable. And mm -hmm. you can make it very, very funny if you want. And that's what he does. It's just observational humor, dude. He's been doing it. He's always been Donald Trump, your friend on the couch. Like that is why he rose to prominence in American politics is like, that style just cuts through the noise, and sometimes it is inelegant, uh, and sometimes it doesn't work. But when you're riffing, you're riffing. Like it's it's been the key to his success for for the entire time he's been in politics. Mm -hmm. I don't know why people act like they're confused by it now. Well, they don't. Act, I I think they act like they're confused by it because it's an intentional confusion. Right. Right. They're trying to once again, despite the fact that they've sat there and watched him over the last six years are now trying to take everything he says literally again, like they did in 2016 yeah, and try to like shadow cast out to the American people. They're like, no, 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 he's going to be, he's going to do all these horrible things when in reality, like he's entertaining an audience. Right. It, it demonstrates the unfailingly partisan nature of the mainstream media. It's like a disease for them that they can't get rid of. They are Democrats. They are doing what they think helps a Democrat worldview and it actually doesn't. The point is, it actually doesn't. The, they, the, the simple fact, and I've said this before, the simple fact that Joe Biden is doing nothing about the border, crime, or inflation, and Donald Trump is saying, let's just fix these things, is that is, that is the contrast that will win this election for Donald Trump. And there's nothing that the media can say. They're going to say he's an autocrat. He said bloodbath. What's he going to say next? He's going to say something next week. <laughs> they're going to they're going to keep running this exact same playbook all the way until the election. And Donald Trump's going to win. And they're going to be like, "What happened? What happened?" And it's like, well, maybe it maybe Joe Biden let too many terrorists into this country. Maybe he let too many That's migrants it. murder regular old Americans who are just out for a jog. Maybe he didn't do anything about grocery prices that are really bothering people. Maybe that's why Joe Biden loses. It has nothing to do with some trumped up bullshit that they're trying to do about Trump. Well, I, I, look, I think you're entirely right. It, if you were to run an effective campaign against Donald Trump, it would be on things that like trouble center right. You know, it would be like, does he do his homework? Does he put people in place that can actually get a job done? Does he care about the things that I that I care about? Does mm -hmm. his record suggest that he actually gives a shit about mm -hmm. conservative priorities and things like that? Right. Like if you were to do that, what you would have to have is some kind of a record that shows that you put people in place that know what they're doing. Right. That you put policies in place that actually benefited the American people. That the economy was better under Biden than it was under Trump. That the border was, although different, a little bit more manageable under Biden than Trump. None of those things are true. None of them. Not None a of them. single one of those things are true. And so, like, as a, as a liberal, well, you look at this and you're like, oh, what a mess. This guy doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Okay. Well, even if he doesn't know what the hell he's doing, he did it a hell of a lot better than you. Right. That's exactly and right. And that's the problem. I mean, so, like, to your point, you're arg try trying to argue two things. Right. One, that, like, his policies suck and he sucks. 
and two, that he's this crazy person. The first one's out of the dealing order. Right. Like, you can't make those arguments because look at the polls on everything. People are already in on the joke. Right. They know that this administration has absolutely destroyed Suck. so many different silos of things that you care about. Right. That you're left with, we got to make this guy a crazy person again. Yeah. Right. That's all they've got. Right. Right. They, they don't need to look any further than... The Ron DeSantis' closing message, like wedge him on something like that, wedge him on something that Nikki Haley was saying and like actually go after it. But they're not doing it. They, they're not going to do it. But they that. also have a they record that runs up against it. Right. Where, where Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis made decent arguments at the end. And I would argue way too late. But at the end of the, that primary where they made cogent arguments were on failings or perceived failings of a Trump administration. But you can't do that when you rolled in as a Biden administration mm -hmm. and failed way harder mm -hmm. than anything that you could ever put on the Trump administration. When I, you know what, what I mean? Like, yeah, what, what I'm saying is that if Joe Biden went out tomorrow and constructed every last mile of border wall, and then he can walk into November and say, look, wall, wall's built. You know who built it? It's me. There's three, three or four dozen Trump plaques down there. There are five dozen Biden plaques like like except he would probably have like 25 percent of the progressive vote that's available to him because they don't believe in it. And that's fundamentally what they have as a problem in the Democratic Party is that good policy for the United States of America is absolutely and totally an anathema to the base of the Democratic Party. Right. Mm -hmm. It just is. Right. And so, I mean, this is the problem that they have. And so if you look at like all of the shit, they're running heads up. And here's the best thing that they've got going. Let's put this up, graphic four. Uh, Joe Biden's shoes. <laughs> Joe Biden's shoes. Look so at they, the soul of they that figured bad out, boy. They figured out somewhere in the White House a way to keep this man upright. Mm -hmm. And what they've got is, uh, according to the New York Post, a new quote-unquote boat anchor shoe mm -hmm. meant for <laughs> maximum stability as the president's falls spark concern. President Biden's new, newest shoes have opened up a renewed debate about his health and physical condition, with some speculating that they were designed to prevent the president from falling. Mm -hmm. Biden's handlers are forcing him to wear a new pair of, quote unquote, lifestyle sneakers. Yeah. Let me just, for, for our listening audience who's not looking on YouTube, can I just describe these sure. to you? Uh, if you've ever been to a nursing home and looked down, you have seen these shoes before. <laughs> They have the two-inch sole, but what I'd like to draw your attention to more than the thickness of that sole are the laces. Mm -hmm. These are laces that are not tied uh, in the traditional sense because you know that the patient is not capable the of doing patient. that. Yeah, there's the, like a drawstring. It's it's a drawstring with a with a plastic uh, clasp that you just. By the way, when my, when my like three year old, when my wife buys my three year old sneakers like this, I'm like, oh, thank God. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it just basically means I can get his foot into it. And you don't have to tie them. And, so, and I'm not bent this over is just, sideways this under is, a table to try to tr tie the thing. It really is just a half step above Velcro. You know? <laughs> it's a straight Velcro shoe. Yeah. It's arguably easier than Velcro. Yeah. Because you put your foot in, and and these laces appear to have some elasticity to them. So what they may they may there may be some give on the tongue, and then it sort of like settles back over the top of his foot mm -hmm. when he inserts it into the shoe. Therefore, this helps Jill Biden, Doctor Jill Biden, <laughs> not like Josh was saying, helping his kid tie his shoes. Doctor Jill Biden doesn't have to tie his shoes every day. Well, Inside uh, Edition reports that the shoes are designed for maximum comfort and support. While walking or hiking, Biden's specific shoe is called the Hoka Transport, the mm. report said, a shoe that has a, quote unquote, wide sole that is, quote, no doubt great for stability. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got it. No doubt. OK. All right. Well, so, you know, uh, we can deal with the rhetoric of uh, the challenger or the stability of the current <laughs> president of the United States. <laughs> One step from a wheelchair. <laughs> All right. So coming up on Ruthless, we're going to talk a little bit about House GOP's reaction to the State of the Union, uh, a bunch of other things that they feel like the Biden administration has politicized. 
Uh, we have a study finds, fellas. Mm -hmm. Study finds. And it's about woke people this time. So study finds some interesting stuff. Can't wait. But before we get to all of that, we want to talk to our, about our new sponsor. Duncan, you've used this. Z-Biotics. Yeah, Z-Biotics. Uh, it's a pre-alcohol probiotic drink. Um, mm, interesting. Yeah, well, like a lot of people think like when you drink, you know, the reason you may even don't feel good the next day is because you're dehydrated. Like, oh, you just drink a bunch of water and you'll feel better in the morning and that yeah. whole sort of thing. But the reality is, is that alcohol gets, you know, it changes into um, a toxin in your gut, like Listen in your to stomach. You with science. Yeah, it's a little bit of yeah, science. He knows. He knows. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, you know, Z Biotics is an enzyme that helps break all of that down. So it's really not the dehydration, it's that toxic buildup in your system, uh, you know, when you are drinking. And I mean, I've used it, it works. It's great. I took fantastic. it too. It's fantastic. I love it. Smash, you like it? Yeah, you know, it, to, to Duncan's point, this was invented by a PhD scientist. And if you take it before you drink, like day of, the next morning is a lot better. I'm just telling you, you should try it. I know we've tried it, and I know we really like it. Yeah, I know I like it a lot, and it's going to work for me very well over the next month. Because as everybody knows, it's March Madness. Mm -hmm. Because of Z-Biotics, I'm confident that I can enjoy games without worrying how productive I'll be the next day. And you know how I like to be productive yes. the next mm -hmm. day. Every day, seven right? days a week. So if you go to zbiotics.com backslash ruthless uh, to get 15% off for your first order or use ruthless at the checkout, zbiotics is for you. You're mm -hmm. going to absolutely love it. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, and believe me, I was going to be skeptical about this situation, mm -hmm. but I'm not. But if you are, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Thank you to Z-Biotics for sponsoring this episode and our good times. Right, fellas? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. God love them. All right. So back into the show. Uh, we've got, I would say, some consternation on Capitol Hill hear about a wide range of issues. The mm -hmm. first one that came up last week was Chuck Schumer. Uh, and he called for an incredibly ridiculous mm -hmm. brand new election mm -hmm. for Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel. Something we don't do in the United States, or I was told we didn't do yeah. in the United States, which is telling one of our allies that a democratic election ought to be held at our behest, not theirs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you have some experience with this, Michael. Yeah. I mean, in 2015, I worked on Netanyahu's campaign in Israel, and the Obama administration had some of their top campaign deputies over there trying to unseat Netanyahu. But so, I mean, I've witnessed it firsthand, us meddling in their election previously. So I'm not exactly surprised by any of this, but it is sort of galling, given the backdrop of everything that they've said after 2016 in Russia, you know? It, it, it was amazing. And so if, in case you missed it, Chuck Schumer, unbeknownst to anyone, rolls down to the Senate floor. And I'm guessing that this is some kind of a uh, strategy mm -hmm. that the Biden administration is doing with congressional Democrats. You know how concerned they are about the Hamas constituency, yeah. as we've talked very about, concerned. within yes. the Democratic Party. They're very key, concerned. Key ally for them. Yeah, a, key, <laughs> a key ally. Like, they're worried about these guys abandoning mm. the Democratic Party. Think about that, by yeah. the way. I mean, every single time for the last 30 years, if there is even a notion of, like, white supremacy mm -hmm. or any sort of, like, weird sort of crazy conspiracy theory that, like, suggests that they may vote Republican, Republicans spend the next three months denouncing it by name and saying right. that they're not going to do it. Wait, wait are, you are you saying no reporters are asking Democrats to denounce Hamas in the, fl in the hallways? Not even a little bit. They're acting huh. as though that this is a process story, mm -hmm. oh. right? It's like, oh, so much so that you've now seen the mainstream media flip. I saw a Washington Post article the other day that was like, well, uh, Israel is now in a problem of their own making. Mm. Of their own making. <laughs> Just unbelievable. Did we, did we miss October 7th? Yeah. Like, I don't know, beheading babies, raping, kidnapping, killing people. Like, what's it of their own making? Let me just, can I, let me stop you right there and make an observation separately from this. It, it, just for our audience, 
mainstream media is a lot easier for you to understand if you think of it in terms of this is an ongoing conversation within the Democrat Party. It's not providing information for you. It's Democrats talking to Democrats. They're talking to each other. So, OK, go back to That's you. a great way to look at it. I'm glad. Oh, listen, this is why we keep this guy around. Yeah. He yeah, just, us- despite Smug's best efforts. Yeah. Smug's, <laughs> Smug's not even here. Yeah, I know. Jeb's not here, and neither is Smug. <laughs> Trump's a nominee. <laughs> not Smug and not Jeb. Well, so, I mean, look, there was no, there was no build to this whatsoever, and the United States Congress is trying to figure out a way to fashion aid for Israel to try to fight back terrorism. Mm-hmm. So it, it felt like a little bit of a jump cut to me because there was no discussion that was happening in the United States Senate at this time. But Chuck Schumer goes down and he says, well, it's clear to me that Benjamin Netanyahu no longer represents Israel. Oh, it's clear to you. as an yeah. American, not the guy who has the capability of voting for the president of or the prime minister of Israel. Okay, that's clear, clear to you. They always, like. Democrats always use American tax dollars when they campaign in Israel. They did it when Obama was president, and they spent American tax dollars on a super PAC to defeat mm-hmm. Benjamin Netanyahu. They're doing it now uh, in 2024 when Chuck Schumer on the Senate floor is campaigning against Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, they always use American tax dollars to campaign against Israel. And according, this is according to Axios, recent polls showed in Israel more than 65% of Israelis support early elections when the war is over. Not over. Mm -hmm. But they also support their leadership during this war. And again, we're October. This is not like we're six months removed from all of this. How about we let them handle it? So you just let them handle it. That's part of the deal. So anyway, you have a bunch of Republicans that, that have dealt with foreign policy over a long period of time. Respond to all of this. And I think we've got we got one clip from McConnell here. Uh, Clip three, please, begets. It is grotesque and hypocritical for Americans who hyperventilate about foreign interference in our own democracy to call for the removal of a democratically elected leader of Israel. This is unprecedented. We should not treat fellow democracies this way at all. So, I mean, here's why this is super important. Without Israel as an ally Mm -hmm. in the region, you don't have allies in the region. Mm -hmm. You have a whole bunch of countries that are either succumbing to Hamas, Hezbollah, radical terrorist elements that we saw congregate in a lead up to things like Mm 9-11, or you have them dealing with Israel. Now... That's like to just wipe away the fact that we have an obligation to defend Israel. But even just a strategic, even if you're just like a straight mercenary about it, Mm -hmm. the idea that you're just not standing with an ally at a time of maximum discomfort for them is insane, completely crazy and insane. Mm -hmm. And that's what this administration, I'm guessing, argued to Chuck Schumer in order to make those comments. What do you guys think? Well, I think that Democrats' most important ally, Hamas, would be upset <laughs> if they didn't follow through with that. I, I, I think that nobody has ever stuck up for Hamas the way Democrats are sticking up for them now. Um, not even not even Obama. I don't think Obama stuck up for Hamas as much as Biden and Schumer are sticking up for them now. And um, they, they must be really scared about what's going to happen to them in Michigan if they don't. Because the moves they're making on an international basis are having real ramifications. America undercutting our greatest ally at their moment of dearest need simply because Joe Biden's numbers in Michigan are in the toilet. I, like, get out of here. The guy doesn't belong in the. I mean, like, I already, like imagine, you know. imagine like Benjamin Netanyahu, like six months after 9 11, being like, all right, well, you didn't, you didn't get Osama, so I guess it's got to be over. In fact, I'm going to call for an uh, emergency election in the United States to dethrone George W. Bush. Yeah. You know? I mean, you just wouldn't do it because that's not what allies do. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, we bring up this story because I think it's just important for you all to realize there is no alliance, no national security 
obligation that you have as an American that isn't mortgageable right. to this Biden administration in order to get them a little further down the road. If they have incredible amounts of young, dumb people who support Hamas, mm -hmm. essentially, in their war against Israel, they're going to cater to those needs rather than trying to lead them out of it, which is incredible to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that's the funniest thing to me about it is that, like, look, there are different constituencies in, in, in order to win national elections, you had to cobble together a whole bunch of different stuff, right? We've talked about the Democratic constituency, how weird it is that you have, like, environmentalists in the same boat as, like, union members when they're, like, pitted against each other in yeah. every possible facet in life, but yet somehow they knit those things together. Young people, like, gays for Gaza, for example. Mm -hmm. Don't you have an obligation as a political leader in this country to tell those people... Look, I understand that you feel everything is about intersectionality and everything is a Marxist view of the world in that there are the oppressed and the oppressors. And you see these people as oppressors. But what you need to understand is that by virtue of being gay, they want to kill you and they do that. If you live in Gaza, I, I don't think the Democratic Party, the Democratic establishment, any of their leadership would ever admit that to their own voters. I mean, they believe it. You know, they believe all this crazy bullshit, too. Like, I mean, think about this. Like, October 7th happens. There's a war in Gaza because the Israelis are trying to get innocent civilians back that were paraded through the streets, beaten, legs broken, raped. Raped. Mm -hmm. raped and Hamas is using them as human shields and sacrificing their own people to keep people hostage, and the Democratic establishment in the United States is talking about a two-state solution and how these Palestinians need a state now. Like, think about how whacked that is, is that after a terrorist attack, you say, I'm going to go ahead. You know, I think at the end of the day, those terrorists made a lot of good points and they should be rewarded for it. Like, it, think about that. But, but to your to your point... On what planet would you want a two-state solution? Would anybody want a two-state solution before Hamas is destroyed? Right. And what Benjamin Netanyahu, whether you agree with his politics, you don't agree with his politics, what he is doing right now is destroying Hamas. So what I don't understand that Democrats are doing, like find a candidate who can replace Netanyahu. Let him destroy Hamas. Let him bring some peace to the area by eradicating this terrorist sect who is ruining Gaza. Let him do that and then find somebody else. Why do they have to do it before Hamas is destroyed? Simply because Hamas is a constituency of theirs. It's an ally of theirs. They yeah. don't want Hamas to be destroyed. And they that's, see, that's and they the see, dirty little secret. They see wrongfully, but they've misread the politics of Israel for years. I mean, the reason that Benjamin Net Netanyahu is there is because of the positions that he takes. Mm -hmm. In fact, he's probably the most moderate of people who could actually become a prime minister when it comes to exercising a war against Gaza. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people of, of Israel, they want to take these guys out. Yeah. They are very united on this issue. They are very united on yeah. this issue, and it's very hard to see where that is a problem. I mean, if this happened in the United States, like, can you imagine after 9-11, all of us are sitting around, we're like, well, you know what we ought to do is just give over New York? We should just give New York to, just, like, just let them have radical it. Yeah. Islam. You know what, Pakistan, it's yours. Yeah. I mean, but that's basically what they're suggesting. Yeah. Right. What's so amazing to me is that there's nowhere in the in the mainstream press that are people that are saying like, really, mm -hmm. like, is this actually your position that you're trying? They keep talking about oh, it's a political, it's a political nightmare for for the Biden administration because Israel keeps waging war against Gaza. Oh, really? Why? Like, why? W w do we miss October seven? Yeah. How is this a constituency that you have that is able – the eradication of Jews is not a political position. Mm -hmm. That is hell on earth. That is the worst possible thing that you could believe on this planet, and yet that's a political position that is navigated and triangulated around in the Democratic Party. 
Just wild. It's wild. <laughs> mm-hmm. It is wild. Anyway, oh. I bring that up first because I think that's a big one. Uh, the second thing is the so, the State of the Union thing. So everybody saw it. It was an incredibly political speech. You got House Majority Whip, according to uh, Axios, Tom Emmer, fellow Minnesotan, a guy that we had on the program, mm-hmm. at Lake Mintanka. Yeah. Uh, he said the GOP sh- leadership could reconsider uh, their invites to presidents for the State of the Union after that because of a divisive speech. Oh, yeah. um, look, I get where he's coming from. I get where he's coming from. I understand that, like, nobody wanted to hear all that, and it definitely wasn't a State of the Union. But, like, uh, State of the Unions are State of the Unions, Mm -hmm. right? And it feels like it rises and falls basic on its own content. Mm -hmm. And we saw out of all of the polls after the State of the Union where presidents typically get a three- to five-point bump in Mm -hmm. the national polls because you have 20-plus million people watching, Mm -hmm. he got none. In fact, it went the other way. So, like, do we really need to talk about banning this thing? It kind of did what it needed to do, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I just really don't care. Like, the <laughs> people like the people are going to see it as, as hyper-partisan if they're going to see it as hyper-partisan. I don't think this is something we should try to control. I mean, holy shit, Nancy Pelosi ripped up Donald Trump's State yeah. of the Union speech standing right behind him. Like, I feel like we're already there, and so... I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle. It just sort of is what it is. It's just another thing that's just sort of happened as we have this just hyper-polarized electorate. And I think we've just got to, like, understand you're not just going to undo the state of the union because it's gotten this way. Correct. Everything else yeah. has gotten it this way. Yeah, yeah I, I think anybody expecting something different from Joe Biden was deluding themselves in the, you know, yeah. period. Uh, the country's been around for almost 250 years. The speech has given every single one of them. They're not all going to be winners. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> next year we'll get a new one. Hopefully, you know, if you if you don't want Joe Biden to give another State of the Union, beat him at the ballot box so we don't have to listen to him again. Like that's how you do it. Yeah, not by canceling the speech. Fifty floors of frights, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> David S. Pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> They're not all going to be winners. Uh, so, all right, study finds, study finds, and it, you know, Wolf, this has typically been a McDaniel special. I'm told you found this particular study finds, uh, which you know goes to show the teams really come together here because study finds is is a, a part of the program. Well, the, I think this is actually it. New York Post, isn't it? Yeah, but study finds. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's study finds. Yeah. So study finds, and this is according to the New York Post, woke people more likely to be unhappy, anxious. And depressed, Whoa. Mm. new study suggests. Whoa. Uh, is ignorance bliss, question mark? Psychological researchers in Finland have created an assessment to help measure an individual's commitment to principles of social justice and made some surprising findings across the Finnish population, including a negative correlation between progressive ideals and level of happiness. Mm. Surprise, surprise. Their findings, published in the Scandinavian Journal of Psychology, as we all know, I mean, mm. a very esteemed publication. That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They suggest other Western nations may seem similar uh, patterns among their socially conscious citizens. Their research trajectory included an extensive reading of intersectional feminism, Mm -hmm. critical race theory, Mm -hmm. queer theory, and other relevant academic disciplines that inform critical social justice. So uh, the bottom line is the most concerning finding was that the relationship between mental health and agreement with the scale. Uh, Specifically, researchers found a high prevalence of anxiety and depression among people that believe the statement, if white people have on average a higher income than black people is because of racism. More broadly, they found that those who identified as left wing were more likely to report lower mental well-being. Uh, Hmm. I get it. I get it. If you spend your entire life worried about the existence of other people, my guess is you're probably not going to have a very high self-esteem. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right? You mean like newsflash, somebody might think differently than you? Yeah, like, <laughs> like, if you're concerned, like at your core, that the ex- mere existence of other people with different viewpoints of yours 
are are going to inhibit your ability to sort of like operate. Yeah, you're probably not going to be like climbing the social ladder. Right? Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's. I think it's more more so. It's it's about like if you are so obsessive about what in life is unfair and the injustices of it, rather than what you can do to control your own life, that you invariably are going to be filled with like unhappiness and depression and anxiety it's sort of like i don't know like in mental health we've gone through i think in like the last 10 years especially with like this gen z population this idea of like reliving your trauma Mm -hmm. and stuff (laughs) no seriously i mean like this is like a core tenet of a lot of psychology now and i don't I don't think it works. Like, I, I think people become obsessive about what their trauma is and reliving it, and it just reinforces all of these negative feelings rather than, like, overcoming them mm-hmm. and, and being a successful person with self-esteem. Right. So I think, like, this is just sort of an outcrop of that. It's like, uh, we just live in a garbage culture. Oh, no, we do. You know, um, where, you know, everything is unfair and none of it's your fault, and so you're just wrapped in guilt and anxiety and you have no control over your own life. I mean, I, I I don't know. I just think we've robbed an entire generation of agency, and they think everything's out of their control, so no wonder they're constantly anxious. Well said, old man. Yeah. Well said. I try. Yeah, you do You do a great job with that, old timer. Thank Gosh, you. I mean, just, you know, really cutting to the nut. Yeah. As they we, say. Yeah, cut. <laughs> we need to get you to write a book about culture. You should. You think so? Yeah, no, mm-hmm. I'd sell, sell millions. I don't think so. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> It might not. <laughs> the, old, the way I see it, by the old man. Thank you. If you could read the audio book. I would do the audio book you for would? free. Wow. Well, maybe for a slight charge. Oh, okay. Just, I mean, maybe just a couple cents on the commission or okay. something. We'll work it yeah. out. Okay. All right. The media is great at distracting you from things you should actually be focused on. While the media was debating Taylor Swift... China, Russia, Brazil, India, and South Africa, basically half the world's population created BRICS. That's B-R-I-C-S, which is a massive economic alliance that's already talking about replacing the dollar with their own currency. The consequences of this could be dire, with your 401k accounts losing value if BRICS is successful. Why risk your personal savings? Diversify your financial future. Invest in the one thing that has proven stable for centuries, gold. From today's sponsor, Allegiance Gold. They've earned the highest trust ratings in the precious metals industry, and their relationships are based on integrity, expertise, and impeccable service. Go to protectwithruthless.com today or call 855-510-GOLD. Right now, get up to 5000 in free silver with a qualifying purchase. Don't rely on promises of ever-increasing stock values or assurances the economy will remain stable forever. Protect your financial future today. Protectwithruthless.com. That's protectwithruthless.com or call 855-510-GOLD. Well, what we've got, uh, so there are three quick variety things. Mm-hmm. First is, uh, there's a new airline that's offering private jet experience for insanely low prices. They basically like worked through a loophole in commercial aviation that allows people to fly on private jets for uh, almost what you would pay a commercial air carrier for. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is according to the New York Post, an airline company is offering a private jet experience at the business class prices, and it's earning them plenty of industrial enemies. JSX, a Dallas-based carrier, is exploiting a loophole in the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration regulations that would allow the company to sell single-seat tickets for scheduled charter planes at affordable race, uh, rates, and they avoid like the whole TSA and airport experience. Yeah. Um, uh, what do we think here? Well, I think uh, on its face it sounds fantastic, but let me channel my uh, smug. My smug, yeah. you know. Let me channel smug, uh, our co co host uh, in absentia here. This is what smug would say: <laughs> uh, insanely low prices. Oh well, then we're just going to ruin it. We'll ruin it. We'll yeah. ruin it, and it'll end up just like Southwest, and we'll have to throw hay on the ground. People will be 
battling themselves like the New York Stock Exchange floor for a seat on this charter flight, and it won't be any good anymore. <laughs> Things have to be hard to navigate. If everybody's allowed into Gen Pop onto private jets, uh, <laughs> then it's going to be just as bad as uh, having to connect in Charlotte. <laughs> so, it's so pretty I think good. You've, done, you've done a great job. Thank you. Pretty good. Uh, Thank you. Doug Parker, former American Airlines chairman and CEO, told the outlet that carriers like JSX should beef up on their counterterrorism rules and be required to meet post 9 11 standards like scanning photo IDs, limited liquids on board, and removing their shoes during screening. So, obviously, what the, uh, the airlines are trying to are do. Are like, no, make it bad. Make it bad for Just everybody else. As long else. as we make it bad. <laughs> if you make it bad, uh, yeah. then we're all in the same boat. Right, right. I don't know. Do you have a thought on that? Uh, look, <laughs> I, I, I just think the market wins in these situations. If somebody's got an idea of how to how to provide a lower cost, they're going to win. Um, and I salute. Them I also for think it. it's a little bit weird that like you could get on a private plane that is like supposed to be for ten people with nine strangers, and like that's going to be a better experience. I don't, I don't know about. Yeah, that. I, 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 don't I don't know about, 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 about the experience. That. Maybe it's not quite as. Are children are children going to be allowed on these planes? Oh, that's a good question. That's what Smug would also want to. And know. then there's hay and everything involved. Yeah, I got it. Okay, all right, so. Uh, another story, this comes out as MSN.com. Sophisticated burglary tourists fly from South America to rob wealthy homes, LAPD says. In a desert around Scottsdale, Arizona, on Monday, police officers hunted for a member of an international heist ring suspected of swiping jewels and luxury goods from homes across Los Angeles. Using helicopters and drones, they eventually found him hiding under a tree. The wanted man, it turned out, was a 17-year-old from Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, the authorities say that the teenager and his two adult accomplices later admitted to breaking into multiple homes as a part of growing trend of burglary tourism oh from South God. America. So basically what happens, and I'll cut to the... I thought that was the, the of platform of your typical Democrat running for Congress. Yeah. <laughs> they literally just look for a seat where they can steal from the taxpayer. <laughs> well, these people are doing it quite directly. They're flying in on some kind of a visa, robbing the shit out of us, and taking the goods back to South America. Hmm. That seems right in the Biden years, right, fellas? Doesn't that feel... It's par for the course, buddy. This uh, president is terrible. He wants, he wants people like this to come in. It, with unfettered access to every suburban neighborhood in our country so they can steal our things and then they can just fly back to their country and they can just give it. Like, this guy is the worst president in the history of our country. Well, I, I do appreciate one component of this whole scheme here, and that is, um, you know, they planned the heist sprees here from the article, and then they fenced the loot before dispatching the earnings back home. So at least, you know... We're keeping the jewels in the system here. Yeah, that's you know? important. So you can just go uh, to the pawn shop and 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 get your. Oh, you're saying they're not they're not back. actually taking it back. They're just they're, they're pawning it here. Yeah, they're pawning it for cents on the dollar, and then they're gonna, I guess, you know. Well, you can't get high dollar in South America. Yeah, right? that's right. You're they have to resell it to the people here. Right? Okay, so they, and then they take the cash and they fly back. And yeah. out they go. Yeah, out they go. So anyway, uh, if you're living in California, yet another thing to look forward to. <laughs> um. Now, if you're living, living elsewhere, the Post, uh, New York Post, uh, discusses an ailing 750-pound alligator seized from a New York home after a gentle giant went for a swim with kids. Uh, can we put up graphic five? This is unbelievable. All right, huge. so in the corner here, what you're looking at is a 750-pound alligator. I don't know the length. Oh, it's 11 foot. An 11 foot alligator. Uh, Western New York community is rallying behind. This is my favorite part of this story is it doesn't go in the direction that you think it is. A Western New York community is rallying behind a man who kept an ailing 11 foot, 750 pound alligator in a pool inside his home where children were invited to swim with the gentle giant. Okay. Wait, they're, they're, they're getting behind the guy <laughs> who had the alligator? Gentle giant? Oh, yeah, no, no, there's a giant. Well, I mean, you can see the editorial ambition that we've got here that we're talking about a gentle giant that is this 750-pound alligator. A 34-year-old reptile was seized Wednesday from the Hamburg house. 
which was decked out in an in-ground swimming pool. And I love that they had to specify that, in-ground. Because mm-hmm. you don't get, like, you know, the above-ground variety for a 750-pound No, I don't, think he, I don't think he's making it up the ladder. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although, if you were to find an alligator, most likely than not, it is going to be above-ground yeah. pool. <laughs> but in, in this one, it's underground, so have no fear. Uh, the homeowner allegedly allowed members of the public to get into the water with the pet um, with the unsecure alligator. So the department, this, the Department of Environmental Conservation is the one that's been on this. And they said that the alligator had numerous health related, uh, including blindness in both eyes. Well, maybe that's what now that makes him gentle. OK, he can't see. Does he still have all of his teeth? Well, he has spinal complications. Does he still have his teeth? And then he he's was, a dangerous animal. He, he was. He's seven hundred and fifty pounds. You're having children swim in with. I don't. He's not a gentle giant. Maybe. Yeah. He can't see. He's old. He probably isn't going to kill them. But he still has razor sharp teeth. And also, it's, it's all fun and games. So he barrel rolls. Yeah. Of right. Kids, or right? what if he just whips the tail into you? Those <laughs> things are like armored, like a dinosaur. So. Uh, I want to go to our animal expert, John Ashbrook. Uh, what do we think of this? Well, it's always interesting um, to read in a story which side the reporter is taking. You know, every reporter in their in their own way is sort of like a judge. They render a verdict on the story. And in this case, the reporter is siding with the alligator. It's pro-alligator. They're sure. personifying this animal. Uh, gentle. You guys have already mentioned the word gentle. You've already mentioned that the community's rallying behind the gentle giant. They've mentioned that it's 34 years old and that it has numerous health-related <laughs> issues, blindness in both eyes, spinal complications. When have you ever heard of somebody concerned about an alligator's spinal <laughs> complications? I literally never in my entire life have heard somebody concerned about a yeah. man eater's <laughs> spinal complications. The guy's putting children into a pool with an alligator and hoping he can get a viral video out of it. The guy should be in jail. The alligator should be barbecued for crying out loud and become somebody's boots and maybe a belt or two, maybe, maybe a purse. Yeah. Like this thing doesn't belong in an in ground pool in New York. Get it out of there. 750 pounds. You could probably make a nice pair of chaps out of that. Oh, you, yeah. You're not kidding, pal. That'd feed a lot of people. Euthanize it tomorrow. <laughs> And feed the community. And then we'll talk about yeah, then who's we'll rallying see if, behind. Yeah, right. We'll see how the community rallies to a free and, barbecue. And, and, and by the way, <laughs> by the way, by the way, uh, we need to get serious about taking out these animals who want to kill us. Can, yes. can I please just present to the audience a clever trap that was offered uh, by one of the minions? Um, if we could play clip four, please, Lee. Now, what you'll see here is a great idea for what you do with a, a, a nuisance pigeon, okay? And for anybody who's listening to this rather than watching on YouTube, what they have is a broomstick set up over a hole dug in the ground, and, in, and over the hole dug in the ground, trash can lid. So when the pigeon walks up to the trash can lid, on one side of the broomstick, down the hole. you got to see this. Yeah. If you're not a subscriber to YouTube, you need to get on here. Because my favorite part about this is the trash can lid uh, has a, a piece of bamboo that's like yeah, running bamboo, through, it the, could be bamboo. Yeah. Through, through the top. It could be a broomstick. could be whatever it is. Household item. But but here, my favorite part about these dumbass birds, each one of them walks up to it, not an expression change. No, no expression right. change. They don't flap a wing. They just fall right in. <laughs> and it, it, it looks like it operates similar to how those trash cans do with the like the swingy top where you just push your hand in and drop the trash. Yeah, it sort right. of operates that same way. And it's uh, it's remarkably efficient. What do you think is in the hole? I think it's just a hole. They're well, real, they're real the, dumb birds. Here's the th- here's the thing. Here's the thing, fellas. Depending on how many pigeons you want to catch, you just dig the hole that deep. Mm-hmm. So with any luck, the hole is thirty feet deep, and what's in the hole? Maybe forty or fifty pigeons. Can I? Can I? They're, they're, they're rats with wings. Can I <laughs> offer Terrible a animal. modification that I think is feasible Great. in the situation? Well, let's hear it. Maybe we take the seven hundred and fifty pound alligator. You put him in the hole. Yeah. Oh, good idea. And then you, you just feed it the pigeons. So that way you're taking care of two problems. You <clears throat> got the efficiency. alligator in the hole. Yeah. And then you got the pigeons that are just dropping off the top yeah. directly into the alligator's mouth. Great idea. Yeah. You let nature work its course on its own. That's exactly right. Man, that's 
That's brilliant. And he he would actually thrive in the dark, as I understand he's already blind. <laughs> so it probably ac- actually works to a strategic advantage to be in that dark hole where he could easily catch every single one of these pigeons. I think that's right, old man. Yeah. All right. Well, you've heard our variety. Uh, it's a good... It all has uh, applicability yeah. to all kinds of... Like you fighting your raccoons. My raccoons or your idea with the monkeys in the banana pool. Well, the banana pool is not getting rid of the banana pool. Well, it's a great idea. Don't get me wrong, but I'm a little embarrassed we didn't think of something so simplistic this and is, effective. This is brilliant. Yeah. I'm not sure that the monkey goes down with the same straight face. Like Put a banana in there. You'll find out. Yeah. You know what we should do? <laughs> it doesn't what? even move. Like the wing doesn't even, they, no. like they're falling and the wings don't even move. No flap. What we should do is on our website sell kits oh, okay. where somebody can make their own trap like that with a broomstick and a trash can lid and a hole. So so I don't know what you would put in the kit, So Michael, our kit but... is a shovel, a broomstick, and a trash can lid. And you yourself can take care of your problems anywhere in your yard. Or just great idea. Just go to Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> or buy them from the Ruthless Friday program. Yeah. Jesus. Michael's just trying to pawn off work on the listener. <laughs> no, We're trying to help yeah, him. Yeah, the guy doesn't want to put it on the I website. I just don't just understand. Press the internet I, I'm just saying, I don't know how that'd be our competitive advantage, that we would make the better yeah, devices. It. People it requires want Requires a little work out of the old man. <laughs> People so here want we it. go. Unbelievable. Okay, well, we're going to get to our interview. This is Dan Dakich, and Dan Dakich, you will remember from last year, we had him on during March Madness to get some picks and whatnot. Recall, he was a head coach for Indiana University Basketball. He was a huge member of the media, uh, it still is, for a number of years. You've seen him, you know him. He's now at OutKick. He's not afraid to fuse a little bit of social conservative, a little bit of fiscal conservatism into his sports talk because the alternative that we've seen over at ESPN for years has just been omnipresent. He was there. Yeah. And the last time we talked to him, part of the reason he wanted to do this job was to try to counterbalance some of that. So we're going to talk to him a lot about his life, his experience, his picks for the NCAA, which you should tune into because I'm filling out my brackets accordingly. Uh, And then we talk a little presidential politics with him. Yeah. So here's Dakich. Very special guest today on the Ruthless Variety program. You heard him a year ago, I believe it was. This guy is one of our favorites, and you're going to have a time of your life life, life listening to him. Dan Dockich, how are you, sir? Boy, that's a big buildup. I don't know, man. I don't know about that one. Uh, <laughs> I like it. I'm good. Hell yeah. Listen, you're yeah. dealing you're doing the outkick thing. You've got I, I'm seeing your content everywhere. You're just crushing it, Bell. You know, since I saw you, we actually started a new local show here in Indy on a CBS affiliate that was uh, kind of dead in the water, 1430. And and uh, so I go, I'm back on local radio doing OutKick, uh, bitching about Indiana basketball, yeah. and, you know, it's all good. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a lot to complain about, obviously, and nobody does it with the uh, pugnacious aplomb. <laughs> Of, of you, <laughs> uh, which I, I appreciate. I know it makes it controversial, but uh, look, dude, it's tough times in Indiana. Yeah, we stink. I mean, that's just what it is. We stink. And, you know, you guys already offended me. You're like, whoa, you got the Isaiah jersey. Stop <laughs> it. That's my jersey. I got it the year after Isaiah played. He graduated 81. I came in the next year. Coach Knight, for whatever the reason, gave me Gave me number 11, and I'm like, yo, I asked for 10. They gave me 11. <laughs> and uh, true story, my freshman year, I'm, I'm, I'm starting. I don't know what the hell happened, but I'm starting. I'm leading the team in assists. And the freaking student newspaper, this little snot-nosed pain in the ass, puts an article. Well, number 11 leads Indiana in assists, but it's not quite the same. And I'm like, well, no shit. That was Isaiah Thomas. Right? <laughs> and I'm me. <laughs> right? Like, tell Noah about the flood here. <laughs> I know. I can't believe I just came in off air with you with the Isaiah blast. I mean, yeah. that is that's I, I regret. And then that. you then you doubled up and you said, well, you hold it. Would you hold this place for a minute? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, everybody knows that we're talking about the legend of Indiana basketball, Dan Dak and chair. And, and obviously that has parlayed itself into an incredible broadcasting career, one that is at OutKick now, where you can kind of fuse 
cultural reality with sports in a way that you can't just do with sports. Uh, ESPN tried off the left-hand side of the map, uh, which you were uh, unfortunately part of it at some point, but then got yourself back to uh, what you do best. You know, I, I grew up in Gary, Indiana, which uh, my dad was a uh, school teacher, principal of a school in Gary, which is we – proudly said, well, it used to be the murder capital of the United States. I don't think there's enough people there now that could qualify. But, um, and my dad was actually a union lobbyist, very democratic place. And so I always followed politics. And how about this? So I get a kick out of people saying there's no such thing as voter fraud. Like, that's full of, I, the guy that taught me to shoot a jump shot was the head coach at Highland High School. His name is Frank Colensis. Frankie was a school board, or excuse me, a city councilman in East Chicago. He and every other councilman got indicted and convicted of voter fraud. Yeah. <laughs> so my man, my man Frankie Colensis, on the day of his sentencing, they had a party for him. He didn't show. He is now in Mallorca in Greece. He's a Greek citizen. No. Interpol doesn't extradite from Greece. <laughs> and they called me one time on my radio show. Hey, Danny, it's Frankie. We're over here in Greece. It's Georgine's wedding. And I go, I don't know who these people are. I don't know who they are. I don't know them. But I get it. You know, so I get to talk about that. And then a guy that was running for, like, mayor of Gary came to my house and asked my dad if he could sign up the empty lot next to our house and get votes from it. And my dad's like, well, we don't own it. Mr. Melham does. And he went over there. So when people tell me there's no voter fraud, I'm like, you're full of shit. I mean, I, I saw it for myself when I was a kid. What are you talking about? Dan, you're telling me that the guy that taught you how to shoot a jump shot is now a Greek citizen avoiding extradition for voter yeah. fraud? 100%. Look at, look at that. <laughs> that is an 100%. amazing story. That is an incredible story. He was, uh, they, they didn't take his passport. But he had it all set. And so what the government did was they froze his wife's money. They did all this stuff because they got embarrassed, right? This guy was literally going to sentencing, and he said, I'm not dying in prison. So on the day of night before his sentencing, his wife it was his birthday. His wife had a party. They were going to go away party. He didn't show and uh, didn't show for sentencing, had a name, had a passport, and next thing you know, he's in Mallorca <laughs> over in Greece. True story. <laughs> That's incredible. That's yeah. incredible. Before we get into breaking down March Madness, which we were going to do with you because we got to, right? We have, to. Have, have to. have to. Our audience wants to hear his ideas. Yeah. Uh, before we do that, I got to just ask a little bit about your broadcasting career here. We got a, a good overview last time you were on about how you got to this place. But one of the things that I really admire about what you do is it's like the opposite of access journalism, right? You, you, yeah. you've, had, you've had incredible relationships with people all over the map in college basketball and beyond that. And yet your take every day is just your raw take. Right. And you're just offending every possible person. I wonder, like, how do you balance that as he as a journalist? Right. I mean, you're coming at this from a journalist standpoint. Um, you know, you've done this. For you know, a while. I don't. You I, don't I come at it from an entertainer standpoint. Okay. I, I've always said, like Seth Greenberg and I, when we were at ESPN, we used to say if we wanted to break every story in college basketball, we could. Because we know everybody. Like today on my show here in Indy, I had uh, Keith Dambrot, who just took uh, Decane into the NCAA yeah. tournament. He retired today and then came on my show. Dan Munson, who got fired Monday as the coach at Long Beach State, and his team won the tournament. Division three national champ, Brooks Miller. And, you know, it's just, it's kind of what we do. Um, I, I don't, I come at it as an entertainer. And I don't have any, I will say this, I don't have any relationships with anybody in the media in Indianapolis because they <laughs> suck and they're no good. And I don't want to have relationships with them. And, you know, they write stories about me, they get mad at me, and they can do whatever they want. But when I was, when I was a coach at Indiana with Bob Knight, and, and when I went back there and was interim head coach, this is true, there was not one article, and still isn't, on me, or on Indiana when I was there, 
that was accurate, like kind of accurate, sort of accurate. So I don't have any respect for him. So when somebody says, hey, can you get the football writer for the Indy Star? I'm like, fuck no. Oh, excuse me. I'm like, hell no. I'm not <laughs> no, no, you can that. say you, you can, you're allowed you, to say oh, that. Okay. Have, we're heavy on Fox damn here. about their opinion or the basketball writer at the Athletics, some young lady. Like, what's she going to tell me? I spent 16 years with Bob Knight. I spent 10 of those in a film room, me and him. So what's some at so what's some lady that writes for the athletic gonna tell me about basketball? No, 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 no. It's very arrogant in theory. It's really not. It's common sense. But hey, but how do you deal with that with sources, right? I mean, I th- I feel like it's different. The journalism side of things, I totally get. Okay, but you're you're dealing with like coaches and people you used to play with, and associations that you made through the course of your career that are now kind of in the center of things. And like, you'll see something coming out of their program. You think it's completely insane. You just straight call them out. Like, do they call you? Are they pissed? I'm trying to think who was pissed. Izzo went on a rant about me and now we're friends. He just got me tickets behind their fence. I DGF saw those meeting. tickets. <laughs> yeah. They were great, great. seats. And it, it pissed Indiana people off. Right. Yeah. Uh, he, he went off on me and then we had an exchange where we both called each other really bad names, like <laughs> really bad names. And now we're boys because, yeah. you know, that's the way it is. Um, I think Tom Crean's mad at me right now because I went off on Jim Harbaugh. And, you know, it's not a very long list, to tell you the truth. Most guys, if they ever had a problem with me, will just call and I'll be like, yeah, I was really stupid. Or, yeah, you were really stupid or whatever it was. Um, but... And you kind of work that out, though. Like It's like an yeah, old school. Always. That's, yeah. that's kind of like what I'm getting at here. Yeah. Is that you've got like an old school way of handling things where you you shoot from what your opinion is. Somebody's got a problem with it. They call you up and you can work things out. And the back right. end is fine. That's right. That's exactly right. It hasn't happened that often. Um, but, no, that's exactly right. I, I call it being a man. I yeah. call it being an adult <laughs> male with a penis. Now, there's adult <laughs> males that don't have penises. But I call it being, look, I'm an adult male with a penis. You got a problem with me? You tell me you got a problem with me. I got a problem with you? I call I go, look, what are you doing? Um, none, of that, none of that precludes you from participating in the Women's uh, Summer Olympics, by the way. <laughs> no, and, and you know what? Uh, no, just, you know, I saw Planet, Planet Fitness – you know, they got, they're letting dudes in the women's locker room and then some, I, it, the world is nuts with all that stuff. It's so nuts. I make fun of it and then everybody gets offended and it's that's nuts. fine with me. It's, <laughs> it's nuts, I mean? but nuts with it. Here's, here's the thing. You've been around a long time. You've seen a lot in college basketball. What I want to ask you is, have you ever seen a bigger snub in your entire life than what the NCAA did to Indiana State this year? I mean, you got Wagner with 16 wins. You got Montana State with 17 and Indiana State with 28 wins. Have well, you ever in your life seen anything like well, that? Well, now you got to understand those two. I'm going to turn on some lights here make me look better. Um, you got to understand. There we go. You got to understand. Uh Wagner and, and Montana State are in because they're automatic qualifiers. They, they won their, their tournament. Mm-hmm. But here's, here's where you're right. Indiana State, they made a big deal about this thing called the net, which is like an analytics wet dream. Like they got all this stuff in there, and this is what matters. No more RPI, the analytics. Well, Indiana State was 27th in the country. Like that's automatic. Mm-hmm. In the history of the NCAA, no one ever 27th hasn't been let in. No one below 36 hasn't ever been let in. And they just said, screw you, Indiana State. And I'm a big believer. And I've never, true story, in 2000, we got snubbed at Bowling Green. And we got snubbed in 2002 as well. And we're one of those teams, like, on the bubble, ESPN is there. And we think, you know, we might be in. We're not. I never screamed at an adult male, (laughs) not named Timmy Knight, Bob Knight's son, more, harder, then I screamed at two members of those committees, calling them cheating MFers, low life mothers. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, I think they cheat. I think I think the NCAA committee favors the bigger schools, and I'll tell you why. Because you got you look at there, and there's a lot of athletic directors. Well, they want they want to protect theirs. I'm the athletic director at Santa Clara. Well, Santa Clara, that lady athletic director who is a complete 
absolute D bag. Her <laughs> name is Renee Bumgarner. She was my wife when she was a softball coach at Syracuse. She was her sport coordinator. And when my wife needed her, her ass was nowhere to be found. She's total fraud. She's on that. She's on that thing. And well, she's good. She wouldn't want to be at Santa Clara her whole life. She wants to move up to the power five. So she's going to protect them in these meetings. It's a, it's nonsense. And Indiana state not being in is complete nonsense. TCU or all these other schools that UBA. have bad or mediocre mm-hmm. years getting in. It's just crap to me. It yeah. is. And, and, and truthfully, I say it, but every other person that I know thanks me. I got like 20 calls today thanking me for what I said earlier today on a different show. They're like, thanks for saying that. I didn't have the nuts to say it. But you know what? It's true, and I've lived that life, and, and, and it's just garbage. So is this something, like, it seems endemic to the NCAA over a long period of time, but now with nil and with the conference realignment and transfer portals and everything else, like, it seems like the NCAA is losing their centralized power in a lot of different ways. When you add on top of that, like, the TV contracts. Right. With everything yeah. the Big Ten and, you know, the SEC is trying to do. and Yeah, it's crazy. So, it, I mean, it goes far beyond college basketball i mean is, is this like their last vestige of just holding on i mean we saw in in the college football playoff for example yeah they're done yeah they're, they're they're not even involved in the college football playoff the only thing they're involved with in the college football playoffs i was gonna say is a little bit of discipline because you know they discipline jim harbaugh but they have no 98% of the NCAA's money comes from the men's basketball tournament. I'm talking about the NCAA office, and then they distribute it. Mm. So they are holding on like crazy to the NCAA basketball tournament. That is literally 98% of their money is, is from it really? that. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. They're out of football. They take that money, and they do good things. They, they, they send it to schools. They subsidize you know, all kinds of different sports, but that's 98%. So they are trying like grim death to hang on to that. Uh, there's really good people at the NCAA. There is, but they always lose in court. And since they always lose in court, people, oh, ah, we're going to sue you. And then they give in. Like there are guys playing their sixth, seventh year of college football and basketball. Yeah. And I don't know how to tell you do that, except mm-hmm. I guess you just keep saying you're suing, but long story short, yeah, the NCAA, they are out of football totally, uh, other than, I guess, a discipline or two, and the basketball, man, they're holding on like grim death. I mean, it, so where does this go? I mean, ultimately, what does the tournament look like in two, three years? Boy, I don't know about two or three years, but five to ten, I'm not going to be surprised if one of two things doesn't happen. You see two massive leagues, one called – the Big Ten, and one called the SEC, and you've got five, six divisions underneath, and they're all power five schools. I could Mm. see that. I could also see the other way. I could also see where they just let everybody in. They acquiesce to all of their members and say, look. But the truth of the matter is, I always said this, with conference tournaments, everybody is in the NCAA tournament. Look, if you play in your conference tournament and you don't lose, you go to the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that simple. So, I, I, I'm not sure where it goes, but I think it's one of the two. You either see everybody under two big umbrellas, SEC and Big Ten, or in terms of the NCAA tournament, you see everybody in. Because one of the most fascinating things to me about this whole deal is that with nil, with transfer portal, I mean, you could make your arguments about whether that's good for the game and good for college athletics or, or whatever, and, and we could do that. But ultimately, you see it for sports like baseball in addition to basketball and football like co- collegiate athletics has become a thing again whereas i think 20 years ago when you saw like the kobe bryants and kevin garnett's just going straight from high school into the nba like it, you thought that was going to be a new trend right that you had every great athlete just basically bypassing collegiate athletics but now with nil not only is it sort of reset the dial in terms of college basketball, college football, but like sports like baseball and and other sports have begun to sort of re-emphasize collegiate athletics in a lot of ways. Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, women's softball has taken off. There you go, yeah. Volleyball just had 98,000 at a game in Nebraska, Mm -hmm. all-time record. No, you're – 
You're right. I don't know if it's based on nil. I don't know what it is. But the, the, the negative is people are saying, well, in what sport other than college athletics can you be a free agent after every year? Like Aaron Judge yeah. of the Yankees would love to be a free agent after every year, right? I mean, the Yankees would have to pony up with the Red Sox every year, and that's what's happening. And I don't know ultimately if that's good. Tom Izzo made an interesting statement to me. He said, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, and players should get more money, and that's great. But he goes, I look at all these young child stars that got all this fame by the time they were 20 years old and what's happened to most of them, if not a lot of them. And he goes, I don't know if it's good. And here's the other thing. Um, it used to be, like I was a coach, I was obsessed, man. I was crazy about kids going to class. Yeah. I mean, you, I, I literally, how about this story? So I, my every kid I had graduated. And one time I'm going to class. A class asked me to come speak at it, and I go speak at it, and I know two of my players are in the class. They had the misfortune or the stupidity to not show up the day I was speaking. <laughs> like, and I'm embarrassed, right? Because I'm trying to tell people Bowling Green players go to class, blah, 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 and these two idiots aren't there. I swear to God, I'd have been fired that night because I had a baseball bat in my office and I called these two jackasses into my office and I broke things with a baseball bat. I went like, I went Scarface slash casino with a baseball bat. These kids are like, you know what I mean? But now the coaches aren't even responsible for academics anymore. Like literally I had an academic record. Coach, what's your graduation rate? hundred percent. You know, other, maybe they were fit. Now it's not even, it, it isn't even a concern. Coach basketball, workouts, recruit, all that. Don't eat, and academics is really going by the wayside, but nobody's talking about it because white media is dying to be down for the cause of, man, players should be paid. So is black media in the national. Nobody's talking about the fact the graduation rates have gone down. Mm -hmm. No one's talking about the fact that how do you transfer three schools in three years and yet you're not ineligible? Yet you're telling me every one of these credits, I was in that game for a long time and that ain't the way it works, but it is now mm. because schools are acquiescing. It just is. You, when's the last time in basketball you heard of a player being academically ineligible? It's a two semester season. Mm -hmm. So there's always ineligibility. No one cares anymore. No one wants to talk about it because everyone's down for the cause of all oh, these poor players, they need to get paid. And I don't know if, if 10 years from now for these players, I don't know if that's the best thing. Yeah, you got a little bit of money, but we all know between taxes and being young, that money's going to be gone. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You got your education. You got an alumni base at, at, at a school to help you if you need a job. No, because you've been to three schools. I don't know. It's going to be interesting down the road here. Yeah, it's, it is going to be interesting. And I mean, it's going to be something that we're following. I mean, we follow this very closely here at the Ruthless Variety Program. I have, I, I'm hoping to get two predictions out of you here today, Dan. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask you the first one now. If people are filling out their brackets today, what's your final four? Oh, man. I'm going to say, and I'm getting hives doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My ass is starting to itch by saying Purdue. <laughs> it's just itch. It is. It, I I'm mean, sorry. that's an, it's you. There's a lot of reason for concern there in the last few oh, years. Oh, I know. Yeah. Rain Smith's hurt. He's a great point guard. But I looked at their draw. Purdue fans are doing what Purdue fans are doing, which is whining about their draw. But I'm like, wait a second here. You got Tennessee as a two seed. Creighton is a three. Who's okay? And then Kansas, who's all banged up, is a four. I mean, look. If you're the number one seed in your district. You shouldn't lose to anybody outside the top four seats. So I like them. I like Arizona out of the West. I just think they're damn good. Like, I think Arizona is big. They're strong. They're physical. I also, you know what? I want to like Marquette, but I can't. I think Houston, they have this point guard named Shed, yep. who, I, honest to God, he's so good and he's so strong and he's such a leader. I cannot go against him, and I'm taking UConn. So I'm a bit of a wimp. I'm taking three ones and a two. But I think this is one of the years that the cream stays at the top. I don't think Purdue loses. I think UNC loses as a one because Arizona's better. But I like Houston. If, if, if Marquette is interesting because they're getting their point guard back, Tyler Kolick, who's really good. And Iowa State's interesting because 
Well, they just beat the living hell out of Houston <laughs> and played them neck and neck at yeah. Houston. Yep. And I love Auburn. Auburn's interesting, man. They are fourth in Ken Palm, which is the most respected analytics, but they're a fourth seed. I can see Auburn getting in there, but I'm going somewhat chalk. I, I, I hate to do it. I know we don't like it, but I go chalk. <laughs> it. I love it. Who, who do you think has the easiest road? What one seed has the easiest road? Is it I, I UConn? Think Purdue. You think Purdue? I, I, yeah, I do. I just look at the top four. Illinois is playing really well. So UConn's got Iowa State, who I think is terrific. Mm -hmm. Hell, Iowa State just won the Big 12 tournament. Yeah. Yep. Illinois just won the Big 10 tournament. And Auburn just won the SEC tournament. They're all in the same bracket with UConn. Yeah. You know, Tennessee got their ass beat. That, that's the two seed with Purdue by Michigan State. Creighton got their ass beat. And Kansas didn't even play their guys because they're banged up. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there going, Purdue fans, and they're already whining. What are you doing? <laughs> and you know what? In the in the West, I'm not mad at the West. Arizona's really good as a two. Baylor's really good in the tournament, and Alabama's uber talented. But I think Purdue's got the easiest, and I think in the East, UConn's got the hardest. Yeah, and no drive-by shootings out of Alabama this year. So, not yet. you know, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Still early. <laughs> What's your second question, Johnny? That's why I never make a prediction. I let tonight come, and then maybe in the noon tomorrow. I always say this about my alma mater, Indiana. Halloween is crazy at Indiana, like crazy. So people ask me, what's your prediction for Indiana basketball? No, 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 no. I got to see the police blotter after the Halloween. <laughs> no. I'm doing here. Same thing with this here in the tournament. I got to see what happens Sunday, Monday night, and then we're ready to go. Got to keep your eyes on Kilroy's. But they yeah. said no to the right. they said no to the NIT, right? Yeah, I mean what? they should say no to nobody. Here's the the NIL. Like Indiana people got mad at me today because I'm like, you idiots that are dumb enough to pay an NIL. That is millions in Indiana that's controlled by Mike Woodson. Mike Woodson barely knows where the hell he's at. <laughs> and Mike Woodson is going to control your millions of dollars. Uh, and aren't we supposed to be paying these players to play? Yeah, like, it, right. you know, so if they say go play in the NIT, yeah, I'll go play in the NIT. Apparently we're not. And I don't care whether Indiana plays or not. It doesn't matter to me. But damn, if, if we're going to pay these guys to play, then go play. I mean, yeah. what the hell? Or don't get paid. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Johnny, okay, so he, yeah, here's the second prediction I'm asking from you today, Dan. This is, this is uh, transitioning away from March Madness and towards politics. Who do you think is going to win in November, Trump or Biden? And do you think Biden's going to be on the ticket? I think Biden is. I, I think Biden is is something is going to happen. Like. Like the dude is like a thousand going on three thousand. <laughs> I'm like, man, like I don't know. I'm not a, I don't want this to happen, but I, I see like a walking stroke or oh. something's gonna happen. And I come my brother and my sister are both prosecutors, and I'm like, wait a second here. I don't know nothing, but Trump's got ninety one indictments. What are we doing? And they're both, yeah, he'll probably get off. I think Trump wins. I think people have had enough. I think the black vote is going to be huge. I think people are waking up to the fact that, you know what, Biden promises, Biden talks, Biden's full of shit. Um, and I think people understand that, particularly in the black community. I, I'm in here in Indianapolis. We're a mess. Like we just had a shooting in Broad Ripple at, at a bar that's like one of the most popular places. Mm -hmm. We got a we got a prosecutor who's on Soros's payment list. We got a mess. And I think people in the in the inner city are tired of it. I think they want some relief. They had more money in their pocket, and Trump did that. You know, it's interesting. You guys probably talk about this, but I've kind of researched this. Trump all of a sudden became a racist when he ran for president, which is amazing to me. And I think people are starting to understand that. I think they're like, man, this media crap is garbage. Mm -hmm. There's a setup going on here. If he can stay out of jail, I think he wins. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask you this. All right, hold on. Mm -hmm. I hear about yeah. these polls. I don't care about polls. The Republicans better figure out how elections are won. And I'm not talking about real votes. I'm talking about somehow this clown got 84 million votes. How'd that happen? Vote harvesting, you know, uh, whatever. Republicans better figure that out because that's the most important thing in this election or else when we go to sleep again, all of a sudden shoot, it's going to flip to Biden. Don't go to sleep. No, I, I think that's right. I mean, we've talked about this a lot on this program. And to be honest with you, there was a whole bunch of COVID rules that were put into place hastily to try to accommodate 
a pandemic that, you know, you can make your arguments were incredibly wrong uh, and put into place without proper guardrails and created a whole bunch of problems. There's also a lot of states in this union that have dealt with vote by mail and early vote and all of this fairly regularly. In fact, I mean, all of us sitting here have dealt over a 20-year period with a bunch of states we used to dominate in vote by mail. Republicans used to dominate early vote over Democrats. Our voters were the one, the responsible ones, right, that got out, made sure that your ballot was in the mail and was counted early and all of this. I mean, we dealt with the 2016 election in Arizona, the last time that we won a federal state. Uh, Statewide in Arizona, we did it on the backs of a great early vote and absentee by mail program. But I think what happened, and the thing you're sort of alluding to here is, you know, when the Democrats went in 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 2020 and added in stuff like unregulated drop boxes where people could just walk up off the street and dump a ballot in there, people, it undermined people's confidence in the system itself. And it caused us to shoot ourselves in the foot as Republicans. Is like, because Republicans lost faith in a lot of these parts of the system, we, we lost the muscle memory of of that process. And we have to get back to that. We can't just rely on election day vote because the Democrats are really good at motivating low propensity voters to vote by mail and vote early. And if we lose that early vote war here in 2024, we're going to end up in the same situation we were in 2020. And and, and, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, Yeah. that's that's exactly what I'm saying. Polls can say whatever polls want to say. Trump's in the lead in the polls. And, you know, our founder, Clay Travis, always puts that out. And I always say that's great. But you better figure out how the actual election works. Yeah. And to your point, get back to what it is that Republicans, as you were just talking about, did and Mm -hmm. do. And if you don't, I don't know, man, I I worry. If you don't figure that out, I worry about whether or not Trump uh, can win that. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's right. And it goes, it's like everything in life, right? If you can bank what you've got, you do it because you don't wait for another day. And ultimately, what Republicans have done over the last few years is wait for Democrats to bank all of their votes and then try to push it all in an election day. Well, you know, in New York a couple months ago, we had a snowstorm, right? In in Nevada a few years ago, there was a monumental weather event in northern Nevada, vote-rich Republican area. I mean, there's a bunch of things that happen that could happen if you don't just take care of business As you go. And when the rules accommodate for it, you got to take advantage of it. Do you think do you guys think because you're much closer to this than I am? Do you guys think the normal person understands that? I think that there is a huge number of Republicans lately that have been persuaded after 2020 that their vote is not going to count unless they show up on Election Day and do it. Uh, And then there's been many situations, as we talked about, with COVID rules and everything else would give them reason to be suspicious. So I think there's a real mix, right? And and if we can't push people back into these are your options to vote, vote however you want to vote, but do it immediately if you have the opportunity, I think we have a huge problem. And, and, And there is, look, I mean, Donald Trump's part of the problem here. Right. Let's just say it. It's just he's part of the problem here and that he when he goes on Hannity and says, don't vote by mail because it's all fraud. The states that have voted by mail for the last 25 years, you're telling your base to have a different voting behavior than the one they're accustomed to. That is going to have some attrition no matter what. Yeah. And I think Why I think would he say that he's smart. Enough. I mean, he, he seems to at least be attuned enough. I can see Biden saying that just because he's whacked out. But why would Trump say that? Well, I think he believes it. I mean, I think at some level, look, in a perfect world, he's right. In a perfect right, world, this, he's right. right. You know, we would put our purple thumb into the into the dip and you'd make sure that everybody who voted was one that was registered and ready to go. We're not living in that world. and We haven't lived in that world for 35 years. It hasn't just happened over the last four years. I mean, it's been going on for a long time. So I, I look, I am hopeful that he can get back to that point where we're actually motiv- I mean, the RNC and some other places have done a decent job at putting voter reg and vote early 
programs in place. I hope they continue all that. We're really going to need it, to your point, Dan. We're really going to need it. And it also comes down to the simple blocking and tackling of running a good campaign and, you know, monitoring and having a relationship with the Secretary of State's office throughout the whole process of absentee and early vote and make sure that all the laws and processes of that are done correctly. Um, and I look, look, I remember in 2020 in the, the Kentucky Senate race, you know, we're getting all those readouts from the Secretary of State's office or whatever, like over the course of early voting and everything. And like we saw it for ourselves, like, you know, we expected to win that race, but you'd be down 100,000, 200,000 votes. Starts to get daunting. You know, uh, in, in, in absentee. But like that's part about, about like running a good campaign is staying on top of that stuff so you know what you have to go out and get to overcome it. I, am I wrong? Because I've said this many times on OutKick. I feel like that's the most important part of the campaign. I mean, yeah. you can get up in front. You're always going to have the people that are going to show up, the people that don't like you. You know, okay, great. That's pretty much set in stone. So if you don't get a handle on this part of the campaign, I don't think you can win. Nobody talks and I, there's about no, it. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. no excuse. We, we there's talk, no excuse we, for not having a handle on this because you know what yeah. it is. Yeah, I think it, I think it's two things though. I think number one, successful campaigns have done this since the beginning of early vote and absentee. It's just something we never really talked about it because like as practitioners, you work on the campaigns and everybody's focused on election day. So no one really goes to, to ex, you know explain that to your average voter. And I I think there's other people who want to talk about it, who like don't know how it works, <laughs> yeah. you know, and they're sort of, you know, sort of exploiting that ig ignorance in, among a lot of the general population and, and people and getting them riled up about the stuff that doesn't matter rather than the blocking and tackling. And this is does. actually, this is a message for you, Dan, and in, in your audience, because you've got a whole bunch of people who share your worldview, but tune in because they want entertainment, they want sports, they want all kinds of different other things. But there's an awful lot of people in our line of work who are selling shit that doesn't exist. Oh, God. You know what I mean? Like, there is oh. never... I'm sure in the field of sports, there's an incredible amount of grifters around trying to sell you 8 million things from Sunday. In our line of work, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't believe it. There are people who have never, ever once worked on a campaign of any form or fashion, but they're raising 50, 60, 70 million dollars convincing people they're the ones that know how to how to do early vote and it's like wow i mean look if, if you want to have a death of a political party that's a perfect way to do it let me ask you a simple question mm -hmm. and this again i said this earlier my brother prosecutor for a while my sister 25 year prosecutor um trump all these indictments people don't seem to care whether or not the people holding Trump's future or at least prosecuting Trump are honest or did they don't care. It seems like you just keep going. Trump stay out of jail. Well, look, I, 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 think, I mean, the, the, there's a practical reality to this beyond sort of what happens in these trials, which I think is unknown. Um, the practical reality is if he's elected president, there's not a special prosecutor that is standing after that. Right. I mean, he's going to get rid of the special cop prosecutors that are ultimately the ones that are bringing these cases against him. It's not going to take like, uh, you know, everybody's talking about will he pardon himself? Will he do all these other? It won't take that because I think the big ones that we're talking about, the likelihood that both the Jan 6 case or the documents case gets litigated before Election Day is basically zero. Like, I just don't think that's going to happen. So. The, both of those cases are brought by a special prosecutor that is president of the United States. He can dismiss on day one. So, then like, if, yeah. Then if you look at the other cases, Georgia, that seems to be falling apart because Fannie Willis, Fannie Willis, that's Fannie, Fannie, Fannie. The, it's big Fannie. Yeah, she's she her credit <laughs> her credibility has been torched here over the last few weeks. And then in but New York, do you York, think that matters? Well, well, I, if, well, if the case falls apart, what what can I'm they saying, do? If the New York case I'm falls I'm apart, saying, what can do they do? Think, do you think her credibility falling apart? matters to the people or her, her credibility going away matters to the people who determine whether the case stays or falls apart well there have already been a few charges dropped much. because of because of that fact what? i mean so yeah. so you could have continued you could have delay and delay and delay in that case and de there's already been a delay in the new york case for the similar reasons 
Yeah, I, I would say the delay component here, the incompetence of how they've administered some of this is what's been working to Trump's advantage. I wouldn't have thought here at the beginning of the year he would have a chance of drawing the inside straight where none of these get to trial before Election Day. I think, you know, they're talking about maybe delaying the New York hush money case. Ultimately, that might still get to trial. There's the Supreme Court is hearing the oral, oral arguments for immunity. Um, they may come back quickly with that. They did. Uh, you know, relatively quickly on the Colorado ballot thing. So it's, I mean, it's still possible you could get to Jan 6, but I mean, it's a tough hill to climb because they're sort of running out of time here. Um, but I mean, I, I think for the Democrats, the idea of putting them in prison before Election Day isn't like really their, their, I mean, I'm sure they would love that, but I don't think that's what they necessarily need. I think what they want is to be able to say convicted felon Donald Trump in every single ad this fall. And so they want to get one of these cases through to trial and jury decision because, you know, I think they ultimately think their victory will be denying him the White House, not necessarily putting him in prison. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, since I'm interviewing you now. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> By the way, Dan, whose uh, show is this? Whose show is this? I'm going to go back to Isaiah Thomas behind you. Just a second. <laughs> yeah, let's, just say, let's just say for the sake of argument that who who would be the Republican nominee if not Trump? I don't think that that that's, is a possibility. No, that's not even that's not out. even in the card. No. I just you I, know, I just you don't think so. No, I don't think so. I mean, there's nothing that, barring a catastrophic health of, event, God willing, that does not happen. Um, there's no the only sort of infrastructure to take care of that at this point. It would be an RNC convention. And, you know, Ashbrook on our team has talked a lot about what Democrats would do if Biden had a similar circumstance or if one where they just decided he couldn't be elected would do. And like hypothetically, delegates could get together, put a slate of like four or five different candidates together and then, you know, after a series of ballots, nominate somebody else. Yeah. I just don't see that on the Republican side, much more likely on the Democrat side. Yeah, no, well, no. what reason reason I asked the question was because you had said that the Democrats would love to make him ineligible, as, you know, get one of push. I think your words were push one of these through. Yeah. So that he would be ineligible. Well, which, he wouldn't be, an, he, he, but he wouldn't be ineligible. He could be convicted and still remain on every ballot and be right. elected. They just want the States. messaging, Dan. Yeah, yeah. They, they want the yeah, messaging. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's not about the trial and the conviction. Would that hurt or yeah. help him? Uh, no, I think that would hurt. Yeah, but 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 here's yeah. let's just entertain the hypothetical for a second. If Trump were to be ineligible, who would Republicans look for? And I think, without a doubt. Our party would want somebody who went toe to toe with Michael Jordan and actually beat him, <laughs> and that's why Dan Dockage. <laughs> we would like you oh. to be president of yeah. the United States. If called something, upon, <laughs> something Isaiah Thomas never did. He Dan. never did it. He never did it. <laughs> I, 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 I was pushing for that this yeah. entire show. Yeah. I was trying to get you guys over that cliff. Uh, actually, they did come to me see if I wanted to run for uh, mayor of Indianapolis. Oh, and don't do it. Was it. it was intriguing. <laughs> don't do it. Until, it was intriguing until I'm like, wait a second. Hold on here. Republican never wins, and it costs a shit ton of money, and I'm in my 60s, and I, no. No, 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 no. God, no. And I was just going to walk around with a picture of me guarding Michael Jordan when we both had hair and hope that I won. You know? <laughs> That's it. I for me. I see you behind your desk with a smile on your face, and that's probably a good place to leave it. Don't run for office at this point. <laughs> Dan, don't, 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 don't do that. Listen, Dan Dak, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you doing this. this uh, let's make it an annual tradition, if not more, shouldn't we? I would hope so for the love of all things holy. And I got to have you guys on my show because yeah. apparently my bosses are telling me our show is just taken off. Great. Great. I don't know. You know, you know, when you like you guys, all you guys, the four of us do is we just do great work. That's yeah. what we do. Yeah. And then we let it fall where it may, may mm -hmm. fall wherever it may. But every day we just do great work and we figure it out later. That's it. Yeah. That's what I'd, we do. I'd love a half hour to talk about nothing but sports. That would yeah. be absolutely terrific. We can do that. I got a lot of thoughts in the NFL draft, too, by yeah. the way. So you let me know. We'll get on there whenever you want. Yeah, he's a Vikings fan, so he's he's hoping for a lot out of the draft. <laughs> <laughs> Man, hey, is there a smart, harder businessman in the NFL than Kirk Cousins? Nope. Nope. No. Like, 
No. I heard a guy yeah. the other day that was talking about RFK selecting Aaron Rodgers, and they, what he was talking about was he picked the wrong quarterback. I mean, if you pick Kirk Cousins, you have no fear about the economy. Honest to God, hey, what? We got, we're in debt? I'll pay it. Hold on. <laughs> Kirk, what you got? Can you write a check? Yeah. Nobody oh, does deals like that guy. <laughs> oh, man. I love it. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Until next Thanks, time, guys. pal, good luck with OutKick and everything you're doing. You're doing great work. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be on. Thank you. Thank you. You got it. It's always a treat to have him on the show. I'm glad he wants to come back every year. I think we should have more often than that. I love a guy from Indiana coming on to talk about what he knows about basketball because that's where basketball was born. That's right. <laughs> that's very nice of my friend to finally admit it, and I appreciate that. It was great uh, great having him on. Uh, and it was great that he, uh, he he got to interview us a little bit about, you know, sort of flip the script on us. I was wondering whose show it was at one point. <laughs> it was great. It was uh, great. No, it's great. It really is great. I'm sure he was in one of those uh, high rises well above the skyline there in Indianapolis. Okay. Uh, we have a beautiful skyline. <laughs> okay. Well, without Smug, uh, I still think we've done it. Yeah. And uh, here's to seeing you on Thursday. Well, I think the only way we can exit this show, a banger, I would admit, is with Hollywood Hen. So let's go to Hollywood Hen. Another banger of an episode, folks. So until next time, minions, keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. Stay ruthless. <laughs>